Hello, in this video we look at the Newton-Raphson and the Gauss-Newton methods for solving systems of nonlinear equations. In part one we went through here and found uh, how to find a tangent line or a tangent plane in multi-dimensions. So we're going to jump right into the uh, Newton-Raphson method. And the Newton-Raphson method is you have k variables, unknown variables, and k equations. And then this method is an iterative method that helps find the solutions to our variables. So an equation in the univariate case, so k equals 1, one equation, one unknown, we have an equation, f, and essentially we want to find the x1 value such that f of x1 is 0. So we want to find this point right here. And then so in part 1, we found that this is the equation of a line. So notice that this is known. We can take the derivative and evaluate it at our first point. This is unknown. That's the random variable. This is known, 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 and it equals 0. So we can take everything to the other side and then solve for x1, which is what this is. Then in the literature, of course, they, they, this is the equation they used. You know, the previous data point minus the, the derivative evaluated at that previous data point, you know, inverse, which in the univariate case means divide by, and then the function evaluated at that point. And then that's, we get a new point. So what we just did was we go up here and then we solve for here. Now we redo what we just did. We take this point and pretend like it's our, our new x naught value. Uh, find the tangent line, find the intercept, and then we and then we keep going. And this is just the iterative process until x n uh, each successive value for x n um, converges to a number, and then we can stop. You know, there's some sort of tolerance associated with it. So the key point is geographically, this is what's going on. Now, the videos that I've seen for higher dimensions, they always, they always make use of a Taylor expansion. And I don't want to do that. I want to keep it ge uh, geographically or geometrically on, on what's going on. And so the k equals 2. So there's two variables, two equations, nonlinear equations. And then we want to find the point such that f of 1 equals 0 and f of 2 equals 0. So what's going on? Oh, first of all, these are the equations for the um, line in x1, x2 space. So remember, so what we did was there's a surface up here, and here's our initial point. On the function, we found a tangent plane, and then that and then we found where it intersects x1 and x2. And then for the second surface under this point, we found a tangent plane. And then we extended it down to the x1, x2 plane. And then, we, and then that makes another line. And then we want to find where they intersect, which is that point right there. And then that's our new point in, in, in this in this. Uh, iterative process. Now that's exactly what we're doing here. We find a tangent line, find a point, tangent line, and so that's what we do here. So now this becomes a new point. We find another tangent plane on surface one under this point and then find a tangent plane under this point and and we find out where they intersect. <laughs> and then that's our new point. And to do that so this is the equation of the line, the first line, and you can, look at, you can look at part one video for that. This is the equation of the, the second line that, that, was, that we obtained from the tangent plane. Then these can be put in matrix notation, right? So this first row is this, second row is this. And these are what are called gradient functions. So it's the partial derivatives of our system of functions. It's called the Jacobian. And then this piece is here. Now in here, um, 
this is known. So this says, take our function evaluated at that point. So it's known. Let's take it to the other side. This is our known point. This is the uh, Jacobian evaluated at that point. So that's known. Take it to the other side. This is unknown. This is known. Right, so if we think about this in matrix notation, call this matrix J for the Jacobian. This is our unknown vector, and these quantities were taken to the other side. You know, this is J, this is our known point minus the function, and um, if we just call this constant C. And actually, if I were to give you this equation, we have matrix J, unknown X, and constant C. How do you solve for X? Most of you would say, well, take the inverse of the Jacobian, left multiply it, and you isolate X vector, and what, whatever is over here, that's what X equals. And you'd be right. So you take the inverse of the Jacobian to both sides. So these cancel, this cancels, and you get this. And so these are known points. So, what, so iteratively, what we did was we just found this point using this equation. And then now we start again. So we use this point like we did this one and find another point. And eventually these all get closer and closer and closer and converge to a point that satisfies this equation. Okay. Now in the literature, you'll see it like this. Xn minus, it's the Jacobian of our system of equations, F inverse, evaluated at our known point, times f of the vector valued function evaluated at our known point. And then this is this. But really what's happening is you're, you're finding that point of intersection, and now you take that, plug it back in here, and then find the next point. Repeat and repeat until this converges. So in the multivariate case, it, it's actually just a logical extension of the bivariate case. So instead of having two components, we have k components, and we have k functions, and we want to find the point that satisfies this. And so it's actually the same thing. So you take our known point minus the Jacobian of our system of functions f inverse, evaluate it at, at our known point times a function, and then this gives us the next point. But really what that's doing is you're, you're finding tangent planes. You're intersecting that into the x1 through xk plane. And you're doing that for every function. And then you're finding where that point intersects. And that's our new point. And then you repeat and repeat and repeat until this converges to a solution for this. Okay. So that's the newton raphson method, where you have k variables, k unknowns. But what if you have k variables and m equations, right? So that would be the Gauss-Newton method. <clears throat> and this is, as statisticians, what we generally see. So if we have, we're doing logistic regression, and we have 100 data points and four variables that we're using, then we have four variables and a hundred equa or a hundred equations because we get an equation for each subject that we have. And we'd use the Gauss Newton method for that. And that's this is what follows. <clears throat> so essentially we're finding the best X such that these are zero. <clears throat> so I say best because we're probably not going to find the exact solution just because there's so many equations and only a few variables, but we can find the best in terms of least squares regression. So these vectors are as short as possible or the, the difference between the act that our, our data and, and our function value is really, really small. And the development is actually the same as the newton raphson method, okay? So we, for each equation, we find a tangent plane, we project it down into the x1 through xk plane, and that creates, um, I'm going to say, a line in quotes. You know, it's a surface in one last dimension. We do that for all 
k or all m functions and then we try to find that point of intersection but it's not quite exact we just have to find the best point you know that minimizes all those little squared errors but the development is 100 percent the same as the newton rapson okay so we have the jacobian of the transformation so this is f1 the first function and all the partials there's k all the way down to the m equation and the k partials so this is an m by k jacobian matrix okay but it's still the same way so on the left side of our equation we have the jacobian this is our unknown and then on the right side we have constants so these are known values and so you can you know this is what it is it's the jacobian evaluated at our known point times a known point minus the function evaluated at our known point so this is a constant and if i were to say how do you solve this some might say well just take the inverse of j to both sides and that cancels but you can't this isn't even in a square matrix so how do you solve this it's not full rank it's singular well we have to use an approach called least squares and I have a video called least squares inverse matrix so basically you left multiply and that's not a hundred percent accurate but you left multiply by the least squares inverse to both sides then this goes away and we're left with the least squares inverse of j times c and that equals our solution and that is actually detailed in this in this video but essentially what the least squares inverse is so let's let j ls so that stands for the least squares inverse of j be this so it's j prime j generalized inverse times j and i have a matrix called generalized inverse if you want to see what what a generalized inverse matrix is so from bv1 our solution is this so it's at it's uh the least squares inverse of j times our constant right but we know that our constant was this so actually we can write it like this and that is the solution to x now i say that but the here's some notes there, there's a problem with the Gauss-Newton method when J is not full column rank. <clears throat> so problems arise in that convergence. So we have to assume that J is full column rank. And as a statistician, that makes sense. So if you're running a, a logistic regression, you want your independent variables, well, independent. You know, if they're not, there's multicollinearity and that introduces problems. So that's the case. We have to assume that we have a full column rank. Then the least squares inverse, instead of using the generalized inverse, we can use the inverse here, right? Because this is a K by K matrix of, of rank K. So we take an inverse and then this stays the same. So our previous solution to X is this. So it's the least squares inverse of J times C where we're using this one. But we know that C was, was this piece right here. So that's C. And then if we put in what we know for the inverse matrix, the least squares inverse matrix, here, and then we multiply it in, we get this. But notice here, this is J prime J inverse times J prime J. So these are inverses of each other. So that, that becomes the identity matrix, leaving just this equation. And over here, we get this. So this is the Gauss-Newton iterative method right here. So you take our known point minus the least squares inverse of the Jacobian of our system of equations times the functional value, the vector function evaluated at our known point. And then we get another point and then we plug it back in and, and we keep repeating. Now, in the literature, you won't see this it expressed this way, right? You'll see it in one of these two ways and more likely the second way. So, But this one is the same. You take the nth value, so your current value, minus the least squares inverse matrix of our Jacobian evaluated at our known point 
times the vector valued function evaluator at a known point. And that gets this. And so remember that, so what this is doing is the same thing. We're, we're, we have a known point. <coughs> we're finding all the tangent planes, projecting it down into the x1 through xk space. So we have all these, I'm going to say lines and quotes, and we want to find their intersection. But since there's so many darn lines and only a few unknowns, variables, <coughs> they're not all going to intersect at the same point. So we want to find the point that is close enough in terms of least squares inverse. So that's what this is doing iteratively. Okay? But what you'll see most of the time in literature is this least squares inverse matrix ex expanded to what it is. And that's this. So it's J prime J inverse times J prime. And that's, you know, transpose. And so that's the Jacobian. Well, the known point minus this which is this piece here. So it's the Jacobian of our uh, system of equations, transpose, evaluated at a known point, you know, da 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 And then this is what you see in the literature. But to me, when, I, when you first see this, you're like, what is going on? How did they come up with this? But really, it's a simple thing. It's just, it's just like the <coughs> newton rapson but that matrix out front is not, um, it's it's non-singular, so you have to use a different approach. Well, anyway, I, I hope this video helped you intuitively to understand what each of these methods are doing. We're going to explore this a little further with some concrete examples where <clears throat> maybe we do logistic regression and we solve it using this uh, Gauss-Newton method <clears throat> and show that those estimates are actually similar to what our SAS produces. Um, just a educational aspect of it. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.